Thank you. Um, welcome to our panelists and to our guests um, uh, to what hopefully will be a very engaging and relevant topic for our times. So the topic is uh, monitoring, moderating on and offline hate speech and, and, uh, and uh, violent extremism. And um, so in that, I just wanted to uh, open the panel, setting the tone for the panel. And in monitoring hate speech and violent extremism, you know, there's always this tension between A, what, con what constitutes online and offline hate speech and extremism, and what the relationship is between the two, and also what is at stake in the monitoring process and the narratives that come out of the monitoring uh, process as counter-narratives to this, right? So we have with us uh, panelists um, who will hopefully uh, deliberate from their context and from their areas of work and expertise on a couple of issues that I thought I could throw out there, and we don't have to pick up on them sequentially, but if you can keep them in mind as you w uh, work through what you have to say, is content. So you know, what to monitor, who decides, and, and whether there is agreement on what constitutes problematic content online and offline, and the relationship between the two. So methods of monitoring, you know, again, uh, what are some of the uh, practical, logistic, um, technical issues at stake um, that we can throw out as valid and effective, um, what are some of the counter narratives that come up for online, as online mo monitoring, and how do those counter narratives speak to what the offline reality is, right? And, um, and who should be involved? Who should be at the forefront? Who are the foot soldiers of countering, of um, coming up with the counter narratives, and who should be at the, uh, at, at the uh, you know, sort of at the back of, you know, fueling this process and in agreement and giving energy to this process, but, but perhaps not come to the forefront. And in this, I wanted to kind of reflect a little bit about the relationship between state and non-state actors, because states have a very strong commitment in this. However, there is a lot of um, issues with state involvement as we see sort of publicly mobilized. So what is a relation, what is an ideal relationship between state and non-state actors? To what extent does civil society platforms, other media platforms become catalysts to effective monitoring? And, uh, and what really are you know, the questions and the directions moving forward? So shall I start from the end of our panel, Zafar Subhan, to perhaps reflect on a, some, uh, some of these issues as you find pertinent from your context and working in um, mainstream media in Bangladesh? Uh. It's right, okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Samia. Um, I, from my vantage point, look at this issue not primarily from a law enforcement or a countering violent extremism perspective because that's not really my specific area of expertise. I look at it as a practitioner in the mainstream media. I edit an English language newspaper here in Bangladesh. And so while we are very cognizant of the dangers which are presented by the proliferation of online media and social media in particular, uh, those of us in my profession are also very wary and we uh, understand that the, a tension exists between the need to make the online space as indeed the offline space safe from those who would use it to incite violence, those who would use it to propagate hatred, whereas at the same time we do need to defend and preserve our right to freedom of expression. And I think with the rise of social media over the last few decades, this has become a much greater, more pressing concern, but no less an important one. One of the things I would say is that uh, I see social media and online communication in that sense is little more than 
um, any other means of communication. The big advantage of online communication and online channels such as Facebook, Telegram, WhatsApp, is they do democratize the means of communication. They give people a megaphone. They allow people to communicate across a, a much wider audience and across wider platforms than they would otherwise have been able to. And now this is, in general, a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing when we look in terms of the negative influence and, as I said, inciting hatred, inciting violence. But the, uh, the point I would like to make is I think at the end of the day, we should look, if we're looking in terms of how to counter it, there are two or three elements to it. One is we can actually talk about, and I suspect the rest of the panel will want to discuss this, how can we actually look at the speech, which is put on various platforms? How does one craft laws which can proscribe it and can take quick action? That's one. But I would also like to look at the second element, which is when the speech, when incitement turns into violence. In we have to understand that at the end of the day, people are always going to be inciting violence and hatred, whether it's online, whether it's offline, whether it's using uh, SMS messages, whether it's using a megaphone attached to a cycle rickshaw. Ultimately, if we can move towards that if they say one thing, but to make sure that acting on something so that if a mob forms, that that mob can actually be dispersed and that we have the tools to deal to make sure that the speech doesn't spiral into violence, be it online speech or offline speech, that may be a more workable solution. Not to say that looking at the speech itself is not uh, something which we need to do. And I think for now, I'll end there. Let's bring in the rest of the panel, and then we can sort of come back and talk about various issues which arise from this. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Oberoi, moving on to you, perhaps what uh, uh, Zafar Subhan was talking about is this uh, relationship between the online and the offline space and how to somehow come up with mechanisms that, you know, can manage the tensions on both, but also... Um, to ensure that you know mob violence doesn't erupt, right? Um, wh what are some of your some of your thoughts on that, and how have you been, uh, in your capacity, been working on that? Thank you, <coughs> thank you. I'll start from where uh, Zafar said that he will not address. He said he will not address the law enforcement perspective. So let me say that I'm a law enforcement personnel, uh, having dealt with counterterror and cyber. I will address basically that perspective. So starting with the basic, when we see the topic of this panel discussion, it is countering the hate, uh, online, offline hate uh, messages, hate content to stop uh, uh, violence, extremist violence. So we, there's an implicit assumption that there is one, there's hate content online available, offline available, and it is causing extremist violence. I don't think there's any debate on these two aspects. Now, if we agree to these two postulates, then the question comes, what can be done? Firstly, uh, in order to counter this, th I think there are three, four steps. One is identification of such content. Second is removal, blocking, or somehow uh, countering this content. Third is uh, counter narrative. And fourth is, as Zafar was mentioning, how to prevent it from becoming viral. And that would also include the technical aspects of preventing it from vi uh, becoming viral on the uh, online media, but also preventing it becoming viral by identifying individuals, human elements involved in be it becoming an, uh, viral and seeing what can be done. Coming to first part, that is the identification of such content, qu uh, there are further questions, who should do that? Should it be the state government? Should it be the tech companies? Should it be the civil society? Who should do that and what should be the criteria for identifying that this content will is hate content because what is what may appear as terror uh, inciting terror to me for some other uh, entity it may be appearing as a fight for freedom so these th they're varying perspectives so question is who should decide it should it be left only to the uh, uh, tech companies to do that or is there a context to that I, should the local jurisdictions be in uh, jurisdictional law should be involved in that what then is your experience on what's been effective uh, 
I mean, there are various modalities of, so you know. The, what has been effective, maybe we look at another element in this is the live transmission. We saw what happened in Christchurch, and I, we cannot say it with full uh, uh, confidence, but people see connection between Christchurch and Colombo there. Now, these aspects have to be looked into. And can this be countered by individual companies? And uh, we have been seeing that many companies have taken the initiatives. They have formed consortium, and they, have, uh, they are now talking about uh, using hashtags, using artificial intelligence, machine learning to do that. But these have failed in the past. For example, the machine learning and AI was not able to flag what was being uh, transmitted in Christchurch because that was not witnessed earlier. Now, question is, how do we do that? What, what is uh, the role of the state in that? And it is in this context, it is important to have a multi-stakeholder approach, and there is a need for a consortium kind of approach in this, and that needs to be developed. And what needs, how can we block it? And for me, the approach which is being followed all over the world right now is to use uh, machines or somebody to identify individual content and try to take it away. This, w this is like, if I compare it to the physical world, it is like, okay, you had a theft, I'll bring your luggage back. But that is not gonna succeed. We have to build deterrence through prosecution. Can there be a deterrence which pro prevents a person from uh, uh, kind of a, uh, posting a content which is unverified? Should there be a responsibility of an individual when they are making that content viral, which can lead to uh, violence in society? So those aspects need to be imp uh, identified and examined. That, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mariam, if you could l reflect a little bit from your context in Afghanistan and um, you know, the relationship between online and offline content, and uh, and what are the effective ways of um, you know bringing about monitoring processes and regimes? Thank you. Um, in Afghanistan, the conservative mindset had existed from long before. Any modernization had embarked um, conser the conservative mindset, causing King uh, King Amalullah to overthrow, to be overthrown. The 1978 communist regime, the, the coup, was followed by the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, was associated with religious and extremist drive that formed a more severe layer of extremism in Afghanistan. Afghanistan, to date, has been at war for 40 years. The offline violent extremism is now online. And in my opinion, the real world is just as important as the cyber world. Tech companies are not the only um, entities to be held responsible. We as a society are responsible because of the root causes of violent extremism. There are n there's not one root cause to violent extremism. As you guys know, you have the individual socio-psychological factor, you have the social factors, you have political factors, ideological religious dimensions, you have the role of cultural and identity crisis, trauma, group mechanism, radicalizer, and then the last is the role of social media. The online accelerates the process of radicalization, hate, extremism, but indications of violent tendencies are more likely to be picked up by those who are physically close to us individuals in person. In Afghanistan, my organization, Her Afghanistan, finds it important to work with communities, the government, families, and to use cyber platforms to battle violent extremism. It's a multifaceted approach. Crisis in government will increase public tr distrust, which will, which will result in alternatives that most likely lead to an ideology shift. In many panels today, I've heard colleagues reference that techno uh, technology is exploited. It's also used to combat these ideologies. Um, I've known Facebook and Google to use AI to better understand terrorists. In Afghanistan, there have been many uh, videos circulated of terrorist uh, groups providing certain trainings. But after, the, after our in-depth analysis, we realized that man, many of those videos uh, were from Syria. Many of those videos were from Syria. 
This helped us counter those narratives. But what's important is not countering, it's to provide proactive information to the public to, not, to be able to divert the attention from the negative um, information circulating. Working with the communities is just as important as monitoring what's online and countering it. Working with families, and more important is in, in Afghanistan is to work with the females. We work with females in a, um, groups that are sense that are more sensitive to insurgencies uh, that many of their individuals are in insurgent groups so we work to understand why these mentalities exist and how we can form better uh, programs and projects that can reintegrate them into society for them to be less likely to indulge in violent extremism Thank you um, for ending on that point, but we'll pick that up again later. So just to continue from there, um, you, you are a professor of uh, terrorism studies, right? So that's your speciality. Um, and terrorism, of course, is not new to the world, but we see a certain kind of proliferation happening through the online space. Um, how do you see the relationship between the online and the offline? And uh, what are some of what do you think are some of the effective um, approaches that either have been tapped into or need to be tapped into? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to look at this from two perspectives. One is from the non-state actor. Uh, some people call them terrorists. Some call them revolutionaries. Some call them rebels. Some call them insurgents, because there is not a single acceptable definition of terrorism as we see. So uh, if I look at it from the perspective of terrorism, uh, what exactly does a terrorist achieve uh, by committing an act of terrorism? Uh, among many other things, the central, uh, the central goal is communicating a message. Now if you look at 1972, the Munich attacks, it was made for TV, it was the first time a terrorist act was beamed live into households when the Olympics were on. If you look at 1995, the Oklahoma City bombing in America by a, by a retired Gulf veteran, Timothy McVay. Um, he blew up a building, killed 168 people, was captured, and just before his execution, wrote in his autobiography why he chose that particular building and nothing else, only because it provided lots of space for TV crews and photographers to come and document the whole deed. Uh, similarly, if you look at 9-11, terrorism is theater. Uh, the whole world was watching. We saw more, over two billion people watching it live. And finally, it brings us back to the Christchurch attack, March 15th this year, uh, where we had 17 minutes of live streaming of the attack. So this was a first made for the internet attack. Now, not all these guys had uh, a legitimate grievance. Some of it was inspired largely by hate. The question is, um, when we talk about the state addressing this issue, uh, it's very easy for us to be blaming uh, the online arena for the ills that happen on, in the real world. Uh, I think the more appropriate response to it would be, yeah, we understand that we gotta monitor uh, the, the web and all that stuff, but the real problem lies with the state, the onus lies with the state in trying to counter the root causes of these grievances. In some cases, the grievances are legitimate. If you look at the Tamil Tigers of Sri Lanka, who were the early adopters of the internet, way back in 1993, they, they set up a website. Or if you look at what's happening in Kashmir today or in other parts of the world, where there are, there are populations, there are groups that have genuine and legitimate grievances. Now, unless those are countered, unless those are dealt with with better governance or even with more sensitivity. Uh, all this talk about dealing with them on the online space, uh, I think is just shifting the blame from poor governance uh, to a medium. That's one. The second aspect, uh, when it comes to this business of hate speech, which I say is very different from terrorism and, um, and insurgencies, uh, hate speech is totally different. Uh, which is very different from when we're, when we're trying to deal with uh, non-state actors like terrorists and violent extremists. Uh, there I understand uh, a lot needs to be done in terms of monitoring and controlling the content 
but here again, there's only so much you can do with controlling the content and monitoring it, and the onus still rests with the state. What kind of action does the state take? If I, if I take uh, uh, the case of uh, a neighboring country, I'm not gonna name it, but if the leadership came out very strongly and removed any shred of doubt that he or she was offering tacit support to the hate mongers, uh, that would go a long way in curtailing and curbing uh, what we see happening on the online space. Thank you. So um, bringing the question back to the state is I think possibly beyond any of our capacities, but if we had to reflect on that, um, how do we then think of these online spaces? I mean, are they, so for example, the Rohingya crisis is termed the Facebook genocide, right? Um, and I know that Facebook has not taken this well and has tried to come up with measures to intervene and, and to sort of um, redress some of, uh, some of the blame that's been apportioned to them. Um, how do then think we think of, what, what do we imagine these on, online spaces to be doing, right? And, and in that, how can they, is it even, even effective to imagine that online spaces will offer counter-narratives? So there's, for example, there's a, quite a lot of talk about, you know, uh, movements against hate, hate speech, right? Or literacy, online literacy for this constitutes ha hate speech and this does not constitute hate, hate speech. Or, you know, when you want to um, Google or when you want to find ISIS on uh, Facebook, something else will come up. That's sort of a counter message, right? What are your thoughts on some of that? And, and in that, where does the online and the offline meet again? Zafar. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Samia. One of the thing, uh, things I noticed listening to the other speakers uh, speak just now is there does seem to be a certain level of consensus here on the panel about not blaming the online arena per se in that while this is a problem, it is not necessarily a problem of the platforms. Of course, they have a role to play in, you know, in uh, they accelerate and amplify hatred, they accelerate and amplify uh, incitement to violence, but the fundamental problem lies not there, it lies one step behind. I, th I, think, I think a lot of that comes from the fact that online platforms and being able to Facebook and all of that has actually, and lends very well to sort of everyone's democratic impulses, right? So it's this great equalizer, everybody can participate and therefore it should remain as such, right? Right, I mean that would be my, um, my inclination. I think I wanna go back to a point which uh, Maria made in her uh, presentation when she said that, you know, what we really need is we need to sort of step back, and I think this is also uh, the gentleman to your right made the same uh, point in terms of um, looking at root causes. I mean, I think if you're really looking in, in our ire and our attention is focused on the internet, it's focused on internet platforms and providers, we're kind of solving the wrong problem to a large extent. You know, we need to, um, and in that sense, I would actually collapse the two categories of online and offline and say that the problems we face vis-a-vis -vis countering violent extremism, countering hate speech, really exist in both, uh, in, in both arenas. And we really do need to you know, look at root causes. We, look, we need to work with communities and families. We need to um, look for the government to take proactive steps to try and uh, establish a counter narrative, give correct information, and call out misinformation when it's out there. So I think I'll end there for now. Uh, Mr. Obroy, so then, how effective are online spaces as platforms that offer counter-narratives or, or provide education and literacy on online behavior and ethics? No, the effectiveness of uh, online spaces is primarily in amplification. They amplify the message. Now, uh, just differing from the, uh, my co-panelists um, when they mention about tackling the uh, underlying factors or the uh, main root causes. Now, 
here this is a online when transmission is happening the online content it is a global issue it's because it's not bounded by any jurisdiction but if you look at the solutions which are jurisdiction based because if you look at the root cause my interpretation of root cause is very different from my neighbor's interpretation of root cause so these are jurisdictional based responses so my approach would be to shift from the uh, uh, instead of the ideology based responses to the action based responses is this uh, facebook post or is this uh, content inciting violence for whatever reason whether good reason or bad reason but if it is inciting violence it should be tackled and we can look at the root cause and the uh, underlying factors later on but if it is causing uh, violence in the society it needs to be tackled and the overall the uh, when we talk about the christchurch and others one basic thing which emerged that we did not have a crisis response protocol and that is another need that in case there is a live transmission in future happening what needs to be done how do we stop it because last time we we were totally clueless what needs to be done and that's where a multi stakeholder approach in developing a solution in the developing a crisis response protocol is very important thank you thank you mariam i just i'd like to for you to reflect a little bit on your work uh, with women because in attempts to counter violent extremism there's been a in the last several years there's a real call to women to a you know step up and you know take up the mantle of doing this work right and the underlying assumption in that is that women have a privileged role to play as mothers as educators as um, sort of uh, in particular capacities in communities. Um, what has been some of your experience in doing that and how does that translate into online activism for women? Not just offline in communities, because I know you've already touched upon that a little bit, but also online activism. Is there a space for women and is there a space for any kind of gendered voices or even marginalized voices? Okay, well. Let's clarify something. The online world, the beauty of it is that you don't really have to identify who you are when you're online. So there, there is a disti distinction in gender when one references it, but when they don't reference it, you don't know about the space. In Afghanistan, um, we still have a largely illiterate society, especially in, in regards to women. And the women who are using the tech spaces, they are acting like cyber troops. So they're taking that form. And how are they taking this form? By identifying certain contents and conversations and following them and reporting and working with communities and working with the government organizations. Um, and then t actually what's really beautiful with the women that I work with is that they take the content, they analyze it, and then they provide it to their religious uh, leader in their community through their brothers. So they'll take a, um, some posts, they'll analyze it, they'll put it in a small paragraph and they'll give it to their brothers and the brothers will go to the mosque and then explain it to the, the, the one who's gonna provide the sermon and from there they go forward. They try to do what they can to contribute to community but it's a volunteer base. It's, not, it's something that they're willing to do to improve their own society. The concern here is that not everybody wants to act in this way. So when you go to the, uh, to the pr rural area of Afghanistan, many of these girls who cannot leave their homes uh, in Afghanistan, uh, there is about 30% or more populations where don't have any access to electricity. So again, it, it depends on which way, which, and I think that the rural areas, the area that are offline makes a huge impact. We've had uh, many instances in hate crime. So we had a female in Afghanistan. Her name was Farhunda. She went to uh, one mile away from the presidential palace in the capital. She went and confronted a mullah regarding something and all of a sudden he just started to lash out and say inappropriate things to her, causing a mob attack against her. So there were 10,000 people watching, 100 men stone, run her over by car and then burn, uh, they, uh, she died. Unfortunately, the reaction to this was so slow, people didn't know how to react, and all of this was actually simultaneously live on social media. When, we, when I was at the Office of the National Security Council at that time, and I reported this, many of the individuals didn't know how to react. 
and the quick, the response of uh, the police reaching there and trying to support, that was also a very slow, slow response. So again, what do we do? Unfortunately, in Afghanistan, you can't, you, the state is not as developed. It's a, it's a new democracy, 18 years old. So what can you do? That's why it's really important to try to encourage the communities to work together. Um, and also, you have to try your best to work with all sectors. So it can't be only with the religious sector, security sector, and the educators. You also have to work with the sect sectors who are unhappy with the government. Um, so women have been catalysts in this field because one, they just want a better society. They want a better home, they want safety. So they are more likely to volunteer. With boys, it's, 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 uh, with men, it's, it's much harder for me to uh, reach out and try to have them to act as cyber troops. It has a lot to do with, um, one, because I'm a female, and me telling them what to do or how they should approach it, they don't find it acceptable. And um, also, they're also afraid to ask to, on how to do it. So uh, and women will come to me and they'll ask me, okay, I, I, this is my program, this is what I want to do, and then I, how can I do it? And then I provide them with the means or the instruction. But boys, they have a hard time asking for that type of help. So um, this is where, uh, Again, you have to work with the community, and uh, there's multiple facets, and I think that, uh, in my opinion, I'd, approaching root causes is much more important because today we have the internet. I mean, there might be a world where we might not have internet again, so again, you we, offline is just as important as online. Um, thank you. Thank you. So, the similar line of question for you. Um, in terms of um, in terms of uh, a counter narrative, um, how do you factor in for the online space and drawing from the offline space? How do you factor in marginalized voices, and who mediates that? Who monitors and mediates that? Because you know somebody's right is another is another person's violation, right? So how how, how does that happen? Look. Counter narratives. How long has it been since everybody's been talking about counter narratives? How many years? Well, I'm going to start with 2001. Okay, that's when 9/11 happened, and that's when uh, President Bush decided he needed to send a counter narrative to the rest of the world, especially the Muslim world, that America was not a bad place for Muslims. Muslims were very happy in America, so he hired this lady from Madison Avenue spent $15 million, they produced a series of four, to four, four video clips, very short video clips, uh, basically interviewing four different Muslim families in America, telling the world how happy we are, land of opportunities, milk and honey, uh, and, the, and the experiment failed, that counter narrative failed disastrously. There was, it was sent out to countries in Southeast Asia, uh, didn't last even one showing, now, why did that happen? Why did such a narrative with, with so much money behind it, why did it fail? It failed for various reasons, but the primary reason was you didn't know your audience. You didn't know what kind of audience you were targeting. You just clubbed the Muslim world as all being the same, not taking into factor varying cultures, variations of the religion, and so on and so forth. And I think the biggest problem with counter narrative today, whether it's offline or online is, uh, it doesn't work for two reasons. One is it's very difficult to precisely identify your audience, number one. Actually, that's number two. Number one is whatever counter narrative you're putting out there, if it does not match with the reality on the ground, uh, it's ridiculed, it's poo-pooed, it's washed away. So your efforts are wasted. So instead of talking so much about counter narratives, I think if we did more on the ground in terms of are uh, trying to at least meet some of the legitimate grievances or even trying to identify some of the causes that are provoking people to behave the way they do, uh, we are better placed to do that than trying to shape counter narratives. Thank you. So I think we should open up the floor for some Q&As. Why don't we take a cluster of five questions and then if we have time, we can... Um, take some more. So I will start with Mr. Um, Shamshir Mobin Chaudhary. The two of, okay, that's fine. And then maybe come after him, right? Thank you. 
Shamshemu bin Chaudhary, I'm a former Foreign Secretary. Very interesting panel indeed. My question would be, I think, to the whole panel, is how much flawed, short-sighted geopolitics play a role in uh, creating an environment when terrorists can succeed. And I think Afghanistan is a classic example where an energy company uh, in, across the Atlantic was making policy for the US government where the pipeline should go to the south of Afghanistan, ignoring the Northern Alliance. The other, of course, classic case is the, Dr. Tekwani, you say it was Sri Lanka, uh, when the LTT was allowed to have training camps in Tamil Nadu uh, for basically India's narrow politics. But my question is that when you talk of online encouraging extremism or radical thought, define how you define radical extremism, and I think both of you addressed this very well. When Israeli citizens are encouraged to watch live on Facebook how the Israeli army keep on destroying Palestinian homes. Who is encouraging that online extremist or radical reaction? It is not a pro-action. It is a state-sponsored uh, uh, act which creates a reaction and they, then those people go and blow themselves up when they have nothing to lose. So I think uh, we should also address how much states play a role in encouraging or creating an environment that leads to radical actions and extremist actions. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just we'll take four or five questions together, and then we can perhaps. Um, can you introduce? Uh, yes. Tell us your name and. I'm Mashrufa Hussain. I'm an advocate of the Supreme Court as well as a television anchor and a news presenter in Bangladesh Television. Uh, my question would be particularly to Mr. Zafar Subhan, and also I'm sure the, our panelists would be able to re relate to this. Um, of course. Our mentalities of responding to things in the media is something that probably needs to change and we need to work on it, counsel, and that's a much wider context. The fact that I don't agree to something uh, about someone does not make that person bad. This is a mentality that we need to work on. Now, my question would be that if we're looking at the wider context, uh, I feel that you know we also need to address issues at our own homes particularly, given the fact that you know, if not only on Facebook, if you look at uh, YouTube, uh, uh, given the open space in internet, anybody and everybody can be a journalist. Uh, the fact that, you know, I can have my own uh, YouTube channel and start talking about something which I myself don't know enough about. And this has actually uh, raised a lot of uh, issues because the fact remains that if you look at YouTube, there are channels which are unregulated. There are people giving their opinions on certain things which are, uh, which they're not, uh, you know, which they're not, uh, uh, which they can't do. And then, but you see a lot of viewers of those channels, and then how do you relate to that? How do you bring these uh, these uh, non-regulant, uh, you know, medias or subscribers? Uh, how do you regulate them? How do you plan to bring them under regulation? Given the fact that you know, uh, uh, you know, medias like you know uh, proper ones like Dhaka Tribune and all of them are working, so you know it, it creates a different space, and that 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 that, that is that can be damaging. So um, I guess that would be my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Professor Mohammed Kabir from Nigeria. Um, I think she's opened the space of what I want to intervene in. And my question to Mariam, for example, was based on the fact that you said one of the things you do is providing information. Now, between regulation and countering by providing information, which works, uh, my mind tells me that you, in advanced countries, they regulate Facebook, they regulate social media platforms. But in less developed countries, this space is opened. And that takes me to the next question, which is about the issue of fake news. And she's also spoken to it about the fact that everybody is a journalist. And I'm glad you've raised the issue of videos being taken from Syria and doctored to be videos coming from Afghanistan. In Nigeria, and I'm sure you know about Boko Haram, we have a lot of these fake news around. Now, it doesn't stop there. And that's why I'm worried about limiting the concept of CVE to just the issue of online, offline. This online, offline divide is amorphous. It's just not there. For me, the online platform is a medium for fake news. There are a lot of, you know, violence against women, against youth, right. against identity. And Thank you. Do you, you've posed your question or? Just the last point. Yeah, just, can you just pose the, the question? The last point is about the idea of ungoverned spaces. 
and I see the social media as part of the basis of ungoverned spaces, particularly in an unregulated environment and which challenges the issue of state-society relationship. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so the question that I wanted to ask, I mean, obviously we are all, I happen to be one of those journalists like everyone can be. I just happen to be, work for the BBC. Uh, the question that I wanted to ask was <clears throat> the war on terror and after that this counter CVE as an industry, the idea of countering violent extremism as a, as a narrative and using that for the security state to get a better hold of citizens' uh, interactions on any form of dissent. This is not new in any of these Indo-Pacific areas. It's, it's been done and dusted. But I'm quite curious because none of you have mentioned that I haven't heard the security state or security establishments and where the balance between, uh, I think one of the panelists slightly touched on it, the freedom of expression and what becomes hate content for which individual? At what point the state thinks this is not good for me? So I'm just curious, where does that line fall? And does any of the, and there are some experts here as well, including someone from the Interpol, that what is overstepping uh, in the CVE narrative? Thank you, yes. Uh, my name is Sabrina. I'm working with the British High Commission in Dhaka. So I have a quick question for Mariam. You have mentioned that females in Afghanistan, they are more vulnerable to us being radicalized. Can you tell us a bit more on that? Why is that? I mean, what are the underlying causes? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last question at the back, please. My name is Laura Yurakishev. I'm from Kazakhstan, Central Asia. And I would like to thank Mr. Professor Tikvari when he was touching the question of uh, how to counter, make counter narratives unless you don't identify your audience. Because you cannot really see the Muslim world as the unified, I mean, as one. There are so many different narratives based on local, uh, mainly cultural specificities. So my question in this regard to uh, Miriam uh, Vardak, I was so much impressed by your work you're uh, telling us uh, today. And to which extent uh, do you use this approach of uh, tradition, culture-based or folk-based narratives in your work within uh, um, the community? Because once you, I, I think the uh, context of Afghanistan can give you this uh, good sample of using this Pushtun Valley code or traditional way of behavior or community cohesion vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Islamic or vis-a-vis -vis religious uh, uh, codes as well. To which extent this is uh, uh, traditional narratives are embedded in your activity. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we should try to answer some of the questions. Um, should we start with you, Zafar, and then move our way up? Uh, sure, thank you. I think there were one and a half questions which I perceived to be addressed to me, so I'll go and uh, address those. I think when we talk about where does the mainstream media and freedom of expression intersect with this issue, it's very important for us to understand that I think few people argue that this space, the online space, doesn't need to be regulated. Certainly it does. I think the debate we're having here in Bangladesh between the government and the mainstream media is how is that to be regulated. We have a law, the Digital Security Act, which has been a subject of much debate between the government on one side and the media on the other. Our sense in the media, by and large, is that while the law, a law, is necessary, this particular law solves the wrong problem. And I think it's important to understand that from our perspective of the mainstream media, we also have an equal interest as the government has in ensuring that fake news does not proliferate. Social media um, provocateurs are very much as, are as much an enemy of mainstream media as they are of any government. And to Mahfouz's point at the end where he says, where do we strike that balance between the security state? And I think that really hits the nail on the head. The danger is while we try and counter something which is certainly very pernicious and requires a great deal of thought and consideration in countering it, we need to make sure that we don't overstep the line. My um, prescription for that would be rather than focus so much on the speech itself, which I think is, is, is very difficult to where to draw the line and how to draw the line, is if we focus more on the 
effect and the impact of the speech in the crimes which are subsequently committed and to make clear that there's zero tolerance for those kinds of crimes, that might be a way to move forward. Thank you. Uh, I'll just make two st uh, small points. Uh, one was with regard to, uh, it was mentioned about the regulations in the online space. Let me make a very sweeping statement here. In today's world, if anybody thinks that we are living in a over-regulated environment, it's a total misnomer. It's living in a fool's paradise, especially in, in a cyber world where there's a problem of attribution. We actually have a plethora of regulations, but regulated environment is missing because if you can't implement and enforce these regulations, it's, they are useless. They are not even worth the paper on which they are printed. So I mentioned in the mo uh, earlier uh, points that if we try to focus on the ideology, what I which ideology, which is, uh, what is, I am saying it is jihad, it is uh, terror, it is uh, freedom fight, we will be caught in a, uh, confusion. The focus has to be what are the impacts of that? What are the effects of that? If any s content is causing violence, then it has to be classified as a hateful or uh, uh, content which is problematic. Thank you. Should I just go? <laughs> um, I would like to brush up on what uh, my colleague mentioned. In Afghanistan, we have many policies that are formed, but we have no regulation, very limited regulation. Um, we don't have that many individuals to take down sites or take down narratives um, as much as we should, and that ha has a lot to do with Afghanistan being a young democracy um, and growing in this field. I know in our intelligence community has some capabilities, but when you go outside that, it's much, it's much more difficult. Um, and uh, mentioning about women being radicalized. Women are not radicalized, they're sensitive to certain insurgent mentality and, and mentality and the mentality that I'm uh, referring to is the Taliban mentality. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that it's an Afghan um, conservative view that has been influenced by religion. And um, in Afghanistan, uh, the word Talib means uh, a student learning religion. And when you become a, a member of the Taliban, then they think that the women as well, as I mentioned earlier, that many of them are, it's an, an illiterate society, they are sensitive to that and they're accepting to it. Um, and culture plays a huge role in this. Uh, women don't ask many questions, they don't challenge many ideologies and they're much more accepting. And I think the reason why they're accepting is because they want they, they want a secure environment. And if they feel that this environment will provide that security for them and their families, they're accepting to it. So I, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and in regards to fake news, I mean, uh, again, as I mentioned, Afghanistan is a young democracy. It, it cannot respond as quickly, which is why I keep mentioning, as my, my colleague mentioned, we cannot counter everything. Because a countering mechanism, uh, it needs a response. That response needs approval. By the time it's approved and it's out there, the damage has been done. Um, so just providing content information that can just help the society as a whole um, is very important. I want to talk about what is needed. I think creating empathy is extremely important. Creating um, and interesting methods of sharing information uh, in Afghanistan, we have a 2.5 memory span, and we also have a 2.5 um, attention span. So I, uh, I try very much to work with the education sector to create more uh, interesting ways of learning and reading, and because providing a document or having somebody read something out on television, it's not going to stay within the community. Um, and spreading positive, uh, news is extremely important. Negative, uh, bad news travels fast. Good news does not, but that's the more reason why we should continue to work on it. Um, we've tried to create mechanisms as good ambassadors for her Afghanistan to go out there and continuously share the po um, good inf uh, work that individuals from every sector, any political group. One of the members mentioned something about politics. Politics drives a lot of the hate uh, in Afghanistan, and it's extremely dangerous, but in, uh, one can't stop any politician or po politics 
perspective. We can only work with it, and the best way to work with it is to just always have uh, a different angle ready to share. And some questions directed for you, perhaps the ones on geopolitics and securitization of the state. You have about a minute. About uh, a minute, okay. 40 seconds. Yeah. yeah, okay. So yes, I mean, there's no denying the fact that geopolitics plays a huge role in some of these movements. And you're right about India arming, funding, training the Tamil groups in the uh, early 80s. Um, um, so there's no gain saying. I mean, there is, it's a fact it continues to be the truth even today. Uh, about the role of geopolitics. But I want to come back to a point you made about Israel and showing them videos, the state's role uh, in uh, abetting. Uh, let's, take, let's take a group like the Tamil Tigers, okay? Uh, they're fighting for legitimate grievances. That's their narrative. So the state responds with its narrative, or you can call it counter-narrative. What does it do? It calls them straight away terrorists. And before you know it, the country's polarized. It's Sinhalese versus Tamils. All Tamils are terrorists. So that's the state's role. When you, when you make it so black and white, without nuances, without accepting that you are part of the problem, uh, you're basically uh, fostering that kind of environment where you make one half of your country, I would say, terrorist because they hate the other half because they think those are terrorists. Likewise, if you look at what's happening with India, Naxalites, once upon a time they were immediately branded as terrorists. And, but today they're not for various reasons, political reasons. Politics plays a large part in how you decide who's a terrorist, who's not a terrorist. In Sri Lanka, for instance, when uh, the Tamil Tigers were branded as terrorists, and in 2002 when there was an effort to mediate by the Norwegians and have a conversation the state stopped calling the Tamil Tigers terrorists. They changed the label to rebels. And when they went back to war, it was back to square one. They were called terrorists. So there's a lot of politics also which plays a part in the narratives just as much as the state endorses act of violence against certain, certain groups of people. Thank you. So I think the panel has tried to wrestle with some of these really difficult questions, starting from very, you know, beyond us geopolitics to the nitty gritties of what, you know, main media main, uh, um, can do, what, you know, the effectiveness of, of um, counter narratives, if at all, and also the relationship between online and offline, where I think the consensus has been that there needs to be, of course, some mechanisms of control online where you can come in and say, this is it, this is wrong, this is violent. But also, I think there's been a lot of conversation around the offline, that you know, the online is just a reflection of the on offline, so if we're not able to manage some of what happens offline, then it, very, it becomes very difficult to filter what comes and then, and then you know, attempts to moderate or monitor online. Um, can perhaps trigger more problem than, than solutions, right? So um, I don't know if we've come up with um, answers. I don't know if there are any easy answers, but I think it's clearly been, well, it's been thought provoking. And before we wrap up, I, you know, I've, I've been asked to ask each panelist to give us a 30 second, what's important, what do we go home with? What's our takeaway from this panel and in terms of what needs to be done? At the risk of repeating myself, I think uh, I would suggest that the focus should be, if we're talking about violent extremism, hatred, is to have zero tolerance for the actions which uh, w w uh, which people commit, the crimes they commit, the violence they commit. Certainly we should, um, uh, proscribe incitement and hate speech as well, but when the speech moves to action, I think that's where we should focus all of our uh, resources, and especially law enforcement resources. I, I would say that there's need for a, a multi-stakeholder focus on this issue, whether it is through GIFCT, ACABA process, Christchurch call, or whatever it takes but a multi-stakeholder approach to identify the bad content, uh, how do we stop its circulation, and to take action on the follow-up uh, for the people responsible.
So collaboration with the state, with the, state. With the, with the tech companies, with the civil society, uh, everybody who can contribute to this. Um, I think it's extremely important to continue to focus offline um, because everything that's happening offline is coming online. So we as individuals are morally responsible to improve the society that we were raised in. And um, we need to motivate our own home, our community, and work with institutions, whether they're government or non-government organizations, to do whatever that we possibly can to improve systems, to reduce violent extremism or hate. Um, because that will then help whatever con uh, suppress any content that will come online. Thank you. Pretty much the same thing. I'll just say, uh, hold your governments accountable and then look at online platforms. Online platforms, as is being reiterated often, uh, it just amplifies and speedens what the reality on the ground is. And the third one is to deal with the online menace. You really, really need multi-stakeholders. It can't just be the state and it's in isolation. So thank you for your 30 seconds summary, um, if it can be done in 30 seconds at all, but I think you've done a good job. And thank you to the audience for being patient and staying. And uh, here's to building more um, collaborative uh, ventures together and uh, looking ahead to uh, decrease tensions online and offline. Thank you.